And now, the Gulf Oil Companies and your neighborhood good Gulf dealer present Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Gulf Oil Companies and your neighborhood good Gulf dealer are proud to present Counter Spy, a program especially designed to help investigate and combat the enemies of our country, both at home and abroad. This is David Hardy. All the enemies of our country at home do not operate in the realm of espionage. There are some who, for selfish reasons, would interfere with the flow of goods and military supplies to our allies and armies abroad. Such a man was Sid Fergus, a West Coast gangster who was out to seize control of Pier 137, a vital waterfront shipping terminal. But there were those ready to stand up against Fergus. Charlie Keno, for one. He can keep his money. He can try all the tricks in the books, but Fergus isn't getting me off this dock. Sid Fergus tried all the tricks in the books on Charlie Keno, shape-up boss on Pier 137. But none of them worked. Your counter-spy organization, though lacking the jurisdiction to act at the time, kept careful watch and reports were regularly dispatched to this headquarters. One report described the situation which took place on Pier 137 on the evening of August the 18th. Sam, Jerry, give Al a hand with the number two plane. Hey, Walt, when you get through loading the number four hold, come and see me in the office, eh? Hey, Keno. Huh? Hiya, friend. I thought I told you, Weaver, never to put foot on this dock again. Sid Ferguson, and me. Didn't no, I you... tell you the next time I throw you right out on your ear? Oh, you'll have to make it so personal. I didn't do anything to you, Keno. You worked for Fergus. That's personal enough for me. Fergus has got a new proposition he wants to talk to you about. Now, what do you say? Here's what I say, Weaver. You can tell Fergus for me. Here is my answer to all his propositions. Come on. Come on, get up. Get up. Sorry. Sorry for that, Kino. Very sorry. You're the one who'll be sorry if you ever show up on this pier again. Now, so help me if I ever find you around here again. I'll tell you. Now, get out and stay out. The uh, district attorney has presented the state's case against my client in a clear, if uh, somewhat overdramatic manner. But now, if it pleases the court, I should like to make only one important point. This. This. Exhibit A. This glass vial which contains, according to my illustrious opposition, a portion of the lethal poison which killed the victim, poison found in the home of my client. And this, mark you, is the only fragment of evidence that the state has produced against my client. I shall now prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that this one piece of supposed damning evidence is absolutely worthless by drinking the contents of this vial. And there you have it, Cora. Well, you, you really drank this stuff, Mr. Ross? Mm-hmm, just as I drank that cocktail. And I'm alive to tell you about it, my dear, just as it happened in that courtroom ten years ago. Well, naturally, the case was immediately dismissed. Well, then your client was innocent. Uh-uh. Huh? Guilty as sin. But, but you drank that stuff and nothing happened to you. Nevertheless, it did contain a slow-acting poison. But how... Remember I said a slow-acting poison. But I still don't see Everything that. was in readiness, you see. The second the case was dismissed, I rushed to a building across the street from the courthouse where a stomach pump was waiting. Within three minutes, the lethal dose was out of my system. <laughs> Clever, Cora? Well, sure, Mr. Wallace, but... Still, you took a terrible chance. Well, I figured it worth a gamble, considering my $10,000 retainer. And your client got away with murder. Yes, but not the second time. Second? Two years later, he chose a more obvious weapon, a gun. 
in eliminating a competitor. He died in the gas chamber for that infraction. And that was quite a shame. After all you did to save him, huh? Well, I wasn't thinking of him. Myself. Before entering the chamber, a sudden and unfortunate stroke of conscience prompted him to reveal the true facts of his first trial. Uh-oh. And that got you into trouble, huh? Well, among other things, I was disbarred. Mm-hmm. You've done all right for yourself, Mr. Wallace. Financially, yes. But money isn't everything. <laughs> no? What is? Well, I suppose it is a great deal, Cora, but I do miss the dramatic moments that a trial can hold. Don't you got enough dramatic moments these days handling Sid Ferguson's business and your other clients? In a way, but I really prefer to operate in front of the curtain rather than behind it. Well, if I were you, Mr. Wallace, I wouldn't complain at all. Right now, Cora, I have only one strong complaint. Which is? You keep calling me Mr. Wallace. Uh Oh? What should I call you? Well, under these conditions, what do you think? James? Jim. Jim. Got it? Not. Pardon I will. But don't make it long. Jim. I won't. Hello? Oh? When? Yes. I'll be there. Goodbye. Oh, that was quick. Cora. Something wrong, Jim? No, but I will have to beg off tonight's date. Didn't? Well, of course. What else could scare me away? You can't wait until tomorrow? I'm afraid not. I've got to leave immediately. I had the lie to meet you tonight. You know, it wasn't easy for me to get away. I know that, Cora, but this really can't be helped. A very important client is waiting. Well, can I go with you? Ordinarily, I'd be delighted to take you along, but not with this particular client. Why not? Well, he happens to be your boyfriend, Sid Ferguson. Get so along, Wallace. Sorry, Fergus. The rain made the shore road very slippery. Where's Bert Weaver? He's inside, way. And uh, Charlie Keno? Uh, just like I told you on the phone, in the bedroom, out cold. The gun? Weaver's got it. Then everything's ready. Yeah, yeah. One in the house. Weaver took the lease on this beach house as I planned it. Yeah, and he's been living here since last Wednesday. That's good. Yeah, go ahead, John. Hi, Mr. Wallace. Good evening, Bert. Here's where Kino gets his. That's it, huh? That's right, Bert. Here's where. And he'll never push nobody else around now, will he, Cotton? It's not likely, Bert. And from here on, with Kino out of the way, you'll be handling things from here 137, huh, Sid? Uh, yeah, Bert. From here on, I'll be in the driver's seat. Uh, let's have a gun. Yes, sir. Here it is, Sid. All ready. Big to catch off the net. Have any trouble getting it, Bert? No, no, no trouble at all, Cotton. Well, then, Fergus, I'd say everything is uh, set. That's right. Everything. This is what I've been waiting for. Oh, Bert. Huh? Where are you going? The bedroom to drag Kino out of here. You won't have to do that, Bert. Oh. Oh, you're going to give it to him in there, huh? Uh-uh. Well, then, we're not giving it to Kino at all. Yeah, but uh, we're letting the officials take care of Kino. Isn't that it, Counsel? That's the way I'm arranging it, Bert. Well, look, uh, I don't get this. Then what's all the setup for, see? You tell him, Wallace. You're the legal brain. The uh, setup is to prove an airtight case of murder against Kino. Murder? Well, I still won't get it. Oh. Get it now, Bert? All set up, Bert. Set up for us when Kino's threatened to kill you. Sorry, Bert. This is the best in legal way. Oh. 
Hello? Harding, Mrs. Huh? Well, where are you? It's headquarters. Okay. What time is it? 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, but that's not important. It is when you went to sleep at 1.30. Look, get dressed and packed. We're taking a plane for the West Coast in 35 minutes. I'll drive by to pick you up in 10. Why the sudden rush, Chief? Murder. I'll explain in the car. <laughs> Charlie Keno has been arrested for the murder of Bert Weaver. That's a shame for Keno. Yeah, it's a shame, too, for every stevedore working on Pier 137 out there. I mean, this is a chance for Sid Fergus to walk in and take over. It's a chance he's been waiting for. Yeah. Him. But it's also a chance for us to walk in. I was about to ask you that, Chief. Why are we flying out? We still don't have any jurisdiction. We do now, Peter. Under the National Firearms Act. The murder weapon? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that gun was transported over state lines six days ago, so we're free to act in the case now. You know, Mr. Harding, I've been thinking. You know what? Fergus could have created this situation himself. I mean, the bad blood between Keno and Bert Weaver. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Well, from what you've heard so far, Chief, is there any possibility that Keno didn't actually commit the murder? From everything I've heard so far, it looks very bad for Charlie Keno. Especially the gun. The gun? What do you mean, Chief? It was Keno's. He bought it in Nevada six days ago. Sometimes winter can sure be a pain in the neck. We mean when you get in your car these cold, frosty mornings and you press the starter, but nothing much happens. And you're right where you started. Or rather, where you didn't start. Now, here's what you can do about it. Keep her filled up with new winter-grade Gulf Nonox gasoline. Because winter-grade Nonox is the sure-fire gasoline that starts your engine going in stopwatch time. Nonox gives you the quickest start your car can make all winter long, up north or down south. And that sure-fire Nonox power guards against stalling in traffic, gives a wonderful smoothness on the open road. Just think about all these advantages you get with winter-grade Nonox. Quick start, fast warm-up, less choking, less stalling, and all these, you know, save on gasoline. So with new Nonox, you get the greatest mileage possible. So keep your tank filled up with winter-grade Gulf Nonox gasoline. And now back to Counter Spy and Jim Wallace's apartment on the West Coast. Now, Mr. Bronson, you say that on the night in question, the defendant was in your cafe. Yes, sir, he was. Will you please describe his condition? Well, Counselor, he'd had quite a few to drink. You mean he was inebriated? Yeah, that he was, sir, that he was. If that means he was drunk. Did you notice anything special about him that night? Yes, sir, I did. I couldn't help but notice. Notice what, Mr. Bronson? Well, when he paid his bill, he reached in his coat pocket for the money, and then it fell out on the floor. What? Fell on the floor, Mr. Bronson. A gun. Well, Fergus, what do you think? Yeah, you did a good job on Bronson. Thank you. If he doesn't slip up in court... Oh, you don't have to worry about me, Mr. Fergus. I got it down pat. <laughs> well, is that all, Counselor? I got to get back to the tavern. That's all, Bronson. Well, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Fergus. Yes, yeah, okay, okay. Here's your money. Much obliged, Mr. Fergus. Well, good night, Counselor. Bronson, just a minute. Yes, sir? Now, remember, you never call me or Fergus again. You never get in touch with us. Is that understood? Sure. Sure, you bet. Okay, go on, go on. Well, Fergus, it's all over, but the sentencing. Yeah, I've got to hand it to you, Counselor. You sure do, Fergus, that $10,000 fee for this matter. All business, aren't you? Is anything else important? Yes, but you're too old to learn about it now. Hello? Jim, honey, this is Cora. Oh, uh, how are you, Mr. Ambrose? Oh, it's still there, huh? Yes, Mr. Ambrose, but I'm about finished with that matter. You still love me, Jim? Yes, that part is definitely settled. You'll meet at the same place tonight? By all means. Exactly. Goodbye, Mr. Ambrose. All business. Now tell me, Counselor, 
How can you live such a dull life? I've never been in jail before. Well, Mr. Keno. Just don't understand. Mr. Keno, Mr. Harding wants to hear the facts. Directly from you. I, I, I don't know how it happened. I don't even know how I, I, I got down to that beach house. Well, according to the testimony of Ernest Bronson, you were drinking in his cafe, drinking heavily. No, Mr. Harding, I'm, I'm not a drinker. I just stop by there once in a while for a beer. That's all I ever drink is one beer, maybe two, if it was a very hot day. Well, Bronson also said that when you paid your bill, the gun fell out of your pocket. But I didn't have the gun with me. But you did buy that gun in Nevada just a week before Weaver was killed with it. Yeah. Well, why did you buy it? Self-protection. There was no telling what Sid Fergus might do to get rid of me. Well, why did you go to the trouble of buying it in Nevada? I just didn't want my sister to know about it. I, I didn't want to scare her or anything. You didn't have to go all the way to Nevada, did you? You think I'm guilty, too, don't you? We're not thinking anything right now, Mr. Kino. We just want the facts. The facts may help you. Go on, Mr. Kino. Well, I was all mixed up. I I didn't like the idea of carrying a gun, but I thought it was the best thing to do. I took a trip to Nevada, just a two-day rest, and while I was there, I made up my mind to buy that gun. That's all there was to it, and it's the truth. Well, I hope it is, Mr. Kino. You can believe me, Mr. Hutton. Well, there's nothing I want more. I only wanted that gun to protect myself against Fergus and his gang. I never dreamed anything like this would come out. Well, probably Fergus did, but it wasn't a dream. What do you mean, Mr. Hutton? I mean that Fergus wanted to get you off Pier 137 the worst way, so he went about it the worst way. Yeah, but it seems everything is against me. You read everything Bronson said? Yes, I read it. Now I'm interested in hearing it in person. <laughs> Should I talk to you about anything? This identification card reason enough? Counter spies. Oh. Let's go. Yeah, okay. Uh, hey, hey, Willie, hey, draw hey, that beer off. I'll, I'll be busy for a while. Hey, Jack, give me a nickel, will you? Uh, go ahead. Sit down. <laughs> All right, Bronson. I suppose you start at the beginning. Oh, what do you want to hear from me? I, I told everything to the DA. Maybe you won't be able to repeat it exactly the same way, Bronson. Look, what do you take me for? Possible, we might take you for plenty. Look, I know my rights. You can't intimidate a witness. Who taught you that? That's the trouble with all you characters. You know your own rights, but no one else's. I I'm a witness. You're treating me like I was a guilty party, Kino. Maybe Kino isn't so guilty. But you can't prove it by me. We have an idea we can. Facts are facts, and that's all I know. No matter how much you give me the business. The facts, the facts. It's also a fact that Kino isn't a drinker. Yet you claim he had plenty here the night of the murder. He did. Plenty could be one drink if it had been fixed. Who'd want to fix his drink? You tell us. Now, uh, you're barking up the wrong tree, mister. All I know are the facts. You know Sid Fergus? I've heard of him. Do you know him? No. What do you want from me, anyway? You say that the gun dropped out of Kino's pocket. That's a fact. Kino told us he didn't even have his gun with him. Well, go ahead. Believe him. He's only a murderer. Maybe he isn't. But maybe you're something about as bad as a murderer. I didn't do anything. What do you want from me? You asked that before. Well, what do you? The truth. I gave you the facts. Not your facts. The truth, I said. Look, I, I told you all I know. Now, will you leave me alone? We'll be back. You might have a change of mind. No chance. All right. We'll be back anyway. What's the matter with Bronson, Chief? 
And he's sticking to his story. Well, I've got an idea we'll be able to shake his story loose soon. Something new turn up? Someone old. Who? Someone old on our books. An Apollo. The name James Raywall Wallace. Does that help you to follow? Wallace? That slimy shiker? Mm -hmm. Where does he fit in? Well, a surveillance detail on Sid Burgess reports that Wallace and Burgess have frequent business savings. Does that mean anything special to you? Well, Chief, it could mean that Wallace set up the whole deal for Burgess to get rid of Charlie Keno. Certainly could. Wallace is an expert at deals like that. Yeah, but prove it. As you say, Wallace is an expert. Well, we can prove it in time. Yes, but time is a thing we can't afford. Yeah. Keno can afford it even less. What do we do? Well, for one thing, we'll keep working on Bronson. There's a chance he might still lead us back to Wallace and Ferguson. We haven't contacted either one of them so far. Well, he might if we keep up the pressure. And there's something else, Peter, about the relationship between Wallace and Sid Ferguson. What? A third party. Who's that? Ferguson's girlfriend, Cora Vincent. The surveillance detail reports some information about Cora Vincent that even Ferguson doesn't seem to know. He's very friendly with Wallace, but on a secret basis. Oh? That's worth knowing. More than that, Peter. That's worth using. If you listen carefully to what I'm about to say, you can save your car and yourself a lot of trouble. To combat the most common problems in your car's fuel system, Gulf's research engineers have come up with an entirely new formula, a brand new product called Gulf SDL. Gulf SDL is an all-year fuel system conditioner, and here's what it does for your car. First, as a solvent, SDL dissolves troublesome gum deposits in the carburetor and fuel lines. Second, as a dryer, SDL absorbs moisture that frequently condenses and freezes in gas tank and fuel lines. And SDL prevents stalling due to carburetor icing. Third, as a lubricant, SDL helps keep valves free and gives smoother engine performance. Yes, Gulf SDL really does a great job with these three important problems. So next time you drive in at your good Gulf dealer, just tell them to put in a can full of Gulf SDL. Yes, for the life of your car, go Gulf. Go SDL, the all-year fuel system conditioner. <laughs> And James Wallace's apartment. And here, Cora, is the folder on Paris. Paris. Mmm. Gorgeous. You been there, Jim? Yes. Following the payment of my penalty to the state, I went there to contemplate my future. <sighs> what a place to contemplate. None better. That's what I need, Jim. A beautiful place to contemplate my problems. When we go to Paris, you'll have no problems. Oh, who said we are going? What? You don't want to? <laughs> Should I say no? No, well. Oh, girls got to play a little hard to get. <laughs> when are we going? Oh, I'd say all my business will be cleared up in three months. I should let that ring. But you wouldn't. It could be business. What? Better answer. Hello? Tesla? Bronson, didn't I tell you not to call me? I can't help myself. A counter spy's been keeping at me. Counter spy? That's right. They're in on it. I don't know how long I can hold on. What should I do? Well, get off the phone first. Yeah, but I I'll got... get in touch with you. Don't call me again. Sounds like trouble, Jim. Plenty of it. The counter spies are in on the Keno case. Well, I guess you want to call Sid then. I do not. What? I've got enough to worry about. You and me. We'll let Fergus worry about himself when his time comes. All right, Cora. Well, I, I... Well? All right, Jim. But what do we do next? You go up to your apartment and pack. I'll pick you up in an hour. And we'll start out on that trip to Paris. Come on in, Jim. <clears throat> you packed, Connor? All ready. Where are your bags? Down in the car. Car? Whose car? All right. Fergus. Close your mouth. That stupid look doesn't become a specter like you. Fergus, you... I was right behind that door when you walked in. What about... I, I, I don't understand. Did I you? sent for Sid. What? He told me everything, Counselor. Huh? Everything, Jim. Are you planning to skip out on me? 
Skip! Well, now, Ferguson, I don't know what she said, but I can explain. Save that golden throw to yours. You'll only be wasting breath. You see, Wallace, Cora here was my insurance against you. Insurance? That's right. I had to sort of give me an inside track on you all the time. You didn't trust me. Oh, now, come off it. I don't have time to laugh. All right. What are you going to do? What would you do in a situation like this? The second thing I'm going to do is take Cora and leave this town. And what do you think is the first thing? Now, believe me, Fergus, that won't be necessary, because after all, I'm as heavily involved in the killing of Bert Weaver as you are, and I can't afford to talk. I can't afford to take chances. You're much too smart at copping a plea. Hey, you want to wait outside, Cora? Doesn't matter, Jim. Okay. Well, you'd be crazy to use that gun in here. It'd be heard throughout the entire building. No, no, not this gun, Counselor. This one is as silent as a cat. Oh! There's nothing silent about this gun for you. All right, Peter, come inside, Mr. Harding. Um, Mr. Harding? Well, I, I can explain everything, sir. Is that right, Wallace? Yes, sir, I can. Now, to begin with... To begin Mr. with, you got a phone call tonight from someone you identified as Bronson. Uh, yes, uh, What? Only it wasn't Bronson who called. It was me. Huh? We decided not to wait till Bronson talked. Well, that's a shabby... Now, wait, before I'm... you go any further, let me warn you, Wallace. You're under arrest for complicity in the murder of Bert Weaver. Anything you may say will be held against you. Yes, but you don't seem to... Uh... Oh. And as for tricks, Wallace, forget about any this time when you get in court. We heard everything said in here. All right, Peter, take them in. Now let's get to the heart of your car, the battery. Almost everything, the lights, horn, radio, even the engine, depend on the battery. Naturally, you want a good battery, husky and strong. Why not drive in at your good Gulf dealer and see the Gulf Power Crest battery? There's no finer battery in the world. Take the Gulf battery plate, big, wide, and massive to deliver plenty of power. And the separator, special rubber that doesn't warp, split, or char. These special features and many others make the Gulf Powercrest battery the best there is. What's more, the Powercrest comes with a warranty, and any Gulf station will back up that warranty. So see your good Gulf dealer and have him check the heart of your car, your battery. Tune in next week. Same time, same station, to another exciting counter-spy report for the American people. Next week, case of the errant heiress. Where there's a will, there's a way, has been changed by certain racketeers to where there's a will, there's an heir. Newspaper accounts of the reunion of long-separated relatives have, start, have started certain characters on the prowl for missing heirs. And sometimes the result is a complete surprise, even to those in on the racket. Hitherto undisclosed facts will be revealed next week in case of the errant heiress on Counterspy. Counterspy was directed by Mark C. Loeb and featured Don McLaughlin and Mandel Kramer with the Oscar Bradley Orchestra. Bill Rogers speaking. Counterspy is a Philip H. Lord production for the Gulf Oil Companies and your neighborhood good Gulf dealer. <laughs> Sure to see the Gulf Playhouse on NBC television every Friday night. Consult your newspaper for time and station. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Mm -hmm.